Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to a special edition of the GKS as presented by Gibsonian Institute. Today we are joined by Griffin Jones of Princeton. Uh, they are a PhD student uh, studying history, um, and they will be talking to us today about the abolition of the slave trade, but also just about history in general. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Okay. So joining us today is Griffin Jones. They are a PhD student at Princeton University. They studied a history of slavery in the United States during the 1800s with an emphasis on labor and social history and historical ironworks. Additionally, they have other interests in the history of the American West and in reconstruction. Griffin has presented their research at the American Historical Association Conference and more recently at the University of Georgia's Capitalist South Conference just this past week. Griffin was scheduled to present at the University of Mississippi's Transcending Boundaries Conference this weekend, but unfortunately it was canceled due to COVID-19. So here they are with us today joining the GPS. So finally, uh, they, are, they are scheduled to take part in a panel discussion on industry and slavery at next year's American Historical Association Conference in Seattle. A heartfelt welcome, Griffin. Thank you so much for coming on today. Hey, Mike. Thank you so much for, for having me. This is just a treat and... And I think we're all disappointed about a lot of stuff getting canceled, but I think that it's really nice to have this kind of, um, this kind of, we were able to pull this off for, for the students. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a really unique opportunity I think they're getting. And it's, and it's so beneficial that it's, that, that you kind of something that's on your specialty fits in with we, what we've been just recently talking about with the, uh, the, the middle passage in the Atlantic slave trade. So uh, is, there any, is there a good point where you'd like to start with that? Yeah, I think broadly to start off, we need some context, though, as to what is happening in terms of the transatlantic slave trade in the decades between the American Revolution, 1775, 1776, and the abolition of the actual transatlantic trade in 1807 and 1808. As your students know, uh, the trade had been going on since about the mid-1500s. However, throughout the two intervening centuries, the amount of traffic in enslaved people was steadily growing at a pretty modest pace, but this changed by the mid-1700s, and there was, during this period, a really exponential increase in enslaved traffic. Uh, this marked this period before the revolution as products made by enslaved labor became crucial to a burgeoning global economy, such as tobacco, rice, and indigo. This matches up with the growth of early abolitionist and anti-slavery societies, such as the religious Quakers, who argued from the position that the slave trade, at the very least, was immoral and brutal. By the revolution's beginning in 1775, there were serious questions as to the morality and existence of the slave trade throughout the British Empire. So you mentioned the Quakers in America as being a leading voice against slavery. Did they kind of influence... Uh, and push societies back in Britain to adopt these ideas, or was it the other way around? Were they influenced by British ideas? They were pretty homegrown. Um, uh, they were in contact with a lot of British anti-slavery societies during this period, um, but they were very. But these ideas were very much homegrown um, and very much adopted from Quaker religious beliefs. That everybody that there's this sort of universal love of freedom from Quaker ide uh, theology that everybody in the eyes of God is a is an equal. Uh, so really that led them to um, naturally take these sort of positions against slavery. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And then we move on to the Revolutionary War. Yeah, the, so the trade actually suffers a lot as a result of the Revolutionary War. And the upheaval that occurred during the war among enslaved people, including and especially their mass escape to both British and later Patriot lines, amplified these doubts regarding slavery. Uh, in the 1780s, after the, after the war, new states in the north, such as Vermont, immediately abolished slavery. So that's, uh, that's pretty interesting to, to, to read there, because I think so often we hear about only like the 14th Amendment and stuff. So contextually, yeah. how was the response to this with Vermont uh, abolishing slavery? Is this like the start of what we see of north versus south, or is this, was it more positive back then? Or what, what do you see? Historians tend to disagree about this, well, to an extent, to an extent uh, that they try to find the, origin, the origins of this kind of sectionalism, this sort of north and south divide. Uh, it comes from, really, the roots are in this period, the writing is on the wall, uh, a lot, especially in New England states, where 
there's this very sort of religious moral fervor during the Great Awakening, um, which was a religious upheaval in which many, many people sort of turned against the traditional religious establishments and uh, sort of became grass rooted in new religious ideology and practice. Uh, so you can read it as a sort of uh, growth of, of sectionalism. But at the time, um, Southern slaveholders in Carolina and in Georgia, they really weren't too terribly worried because Vermont is a, at this point is a very frontier-esque kind of uh, situation. Mm -hmm. um, there are still indigenous wars going on during this period, and it seems as though it's kind of isolated from, from, the, rest of the, uh, from the rest of the British mainland. Okay, and then what do we see coming from other states at this period? So other states in the North begin sort of these long, protracted struggles over the gradual emancipation of slavery rather than the immediate abolition of slavery. This is a divide that will characterize the abolitionist and anti-slavery movements until the Civil War, this immediatism versus gradualism. Um, these struggles initially would last until the, about the 1810s and 1820s in states like New Jersey or New York. Even in some southern states, such as Virginia, people began to have second thoughts about the use of slavery, prominent among them Thomas Jefferson. During this decade into the 1790s, the slave trade really came to a grinding halt to the new United States. However, just as strongly, if not more so, as anti-slavery activists and abolitionists, pro-slavery delegates to Congress fought to maintain and expand slavery even in northern states. As they saw this sort of Ver – Vermont was one sort of you know, state that they were like, okay, these sort of radicals are kind of isolated. But once they saw these struggles taking place across the north, they became more and more worried, especially as it encroached in Virginia, the sort of old dominion of slavery in the, uh, in the United States. So as it kind of moves south from Vermont – there's a little bit more of, you mentioned sectionalism of the North versus South, so that's where we start to see that grow. Exactly, yeah. And uh, internationally, on the international scale, this aboli American abolitionist movement was very quickly tied, as I've sort of mentioned with the Quakers initially, it was tied to the British movement. Uh, printed abolitionist pamphlets and images circulated throughout the Western world. Perhaps most prominently, as your students know, the image of the slave ship Brooks drawn by the uh, British abolitionist Thomas Clarkson. Even French abolition, the Société de Noir, had influential power over the French revolutionary government, leading to the then temporary abolition of slavery across the French empire by, the, uh, by 1794. However, what was most important during this period in the 1790s was the Haitian Revolution by far. This revolution in Haiti, then a French colony named Saint-Domingue in 1791, spread mass anxiety uh, among whites in Europe and the United States for fear of enslaved insurrection coming to their front doors. Uh, it was what Thomas Jefferson called a fire bell in the night. Even pro-slavery advocates were forced to rethink the importations of the transatlantic slave trade by the 1800s, particularly in Britain and the United States, even as the tra traffic reopened to a frenzy in, by 1801. That's, uh, that's some very interesting stuff right there. So as an aside, I just want to urge my students to check out this topic, the Haitian Revolution. It's the first successful slave rebellion in the New World. And uh, for the seventh grade, as Griffin just mentioned, the, the, the revolution takes place on Saint-Domingue, which is a colony some of us may have played, ad, played as in the American Civilism Simulation. I know that you'll recall the frustrations you had trying to trying to survive and remember we were we established that uh, colonies are, are they're not there for their own benefit they're there for the benefit of their empire country uh, and I know that a lot of us are clamoring for revolution so it might be uh, refreshing to know that they, they went and did it uh, so yep. let's uh, let's let's pull back now to maybe some some of the action that's happening back over in Britain yeah yeah absolutely. Uh, so there's a, one guy who really stands out as a politician during this period in Britain. His name is William Wilberforce, and he held immense sway over the British Parliament during the early during the first decade of the 1800s. In the United States, meanwhile, the Con Constitutional Convention back in the late 1780s determined that debates about the legality of the slave trade were to be postponed by a generation, at least until 1807. Uh, at this point, more enslaved people had been trafficked to the United States, by this point being 1807. In just those seven years, 
More enslaved people have been trafficked to the United States than even peaks in the mid-1700s, almost as if slaveholders knew that the trade was soon to be closed given the widespread fears of African rebellion and revolution coming from Haiti. Um, even so, as sort of... Go ahead. Sorry, uh, just to interrupt real quick. So if, so if I understand you correctly, you're making a case that Americans knew slave trade was going to come to an end and they're like stockpiling, if you will, like they're just trying to... Yeah, I, I think um, it's it's a curious question why they decided to go into this trade with a frenzy. And I think part of it came from the fear, their fear of slavery ending as a result of the end of the slave trade was overrode their fears of, ins- of any insurrection. Insurrection is sort of a constant presence, mm-hmm. present fear at least among slaveholders during this period. It's a constant threat, especially in areas where there is a black majority of an, an enslaved black majority. Um, there is less control over enslaved people. There's way less sort of um, oversight going on. And that's why violence is so crucial to upholding slavery during this period. And well, of course, throughout history, but especially during this period. Okay. So um, even as Carolinians and Georgians retreated, um, they sort of keen to accept that the slave trade would come to an end, um, and they took their bets, basically. They took their took a gamble that slavery would survive the end of the slave trade. And the Act of 1807 in the U.S., as well as in Britain, ban- led by William Wilberforce, banned the slave trade by January 1st, 1808. Subsequent acts in the next 13 years made transatlantic slave trading a capital offense, But even this did not necessarily stop illegal trading as late as the 1860s, uh, where I do research in Mobile, Alabama recently, the last, the the so-called last slave ship to the to the United States was recently discovered in an archaeological find in the River Delta named the Clotilde. And that was a ship that was led by a an Alabama man in Mobile across the Atlantic to capture, effectively kidnap. Uh, Africans in West Africa, and they brought them back, and they uh, stayed in Mobile for the rest of their lives, going into the 20th century. Wow, that's um, an interesting find there. That, was that a, you were mentioning that's a recent uh, discovery there? Yeah, it's a recent discovery, like within the last year. Yeah, that's very exciting. Yeah, it's very exciting. Um, it's a, it's definitely a, a, a huge find because it's so ingrained in the sort of historical memory of Mobile. This sort of uh, this voyage. Okay. So there's this illegal trading going on on the one hand, right? Mm-hmm. But also these laws did not foresee the domestic slave trade. They, they only banned the transatlantic slave trade. Mm-hmm. This domestic slave trade, which boomed from the from about 1815 to 1820 to the dawn of the Civil War, uh, was primarily internal. It was based in the between the upper South states of say Virginia, Maryland, and the Carolinas to lower South states, such as Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and later Texas. So, Slavery, so I just got jump in real quick there? Sorry, that's, uh, you're no, bringing no, no, up no, no. an interesting part. So two parts to this, actually. So as you mentioned, they, they ban the slave trade internationally, but not domestically. So I'm going back to my stockpiling idea. Do you think that they had intentions to leave this ambiguity, to leave this like loophole for, say, uh, within the nation as long as possible and see how long it could kind of last? Absolutely. Uh, what's really important about this is that slaveholders were just as intent, if not more so, on keeping slavery intact as much as possible for the entirety of the period we're talking about, as much if not more so than anti-slavery activists. They were a very powerful group, and as historians have noted, they dominated the federal government for the first 80 or so years of of its existence. All right. Um, So slavery thus actually, rather than dying with the slave trade, uh, the slaveholders ended up, their gamble paid off. Slavery boomed in the new American Republic, even without the transatlantic trade. And even in British colonies, slavery continued to produce massive profits from Jamaica and other islands to the mainland until mass debate and mass action ended the institution in the 1830s. Historians disagree whether the ultimate motive to this abolition was economic or moral or some combination of both, 
But ultimately, Britain ended slavery 30 years before the Emancipation Proclamation, even if it continued to rely on uh, United States slavery to produce cotton and other textile and other um, commodities for its booming textile mills. Okay, so uh, that's that's an interesting kind of thing to bring up, and I think a lot of people, at least my own students, probably don't realize that we were one of the last countries to end uh, slavery. Now, our textbook credits King George III for this decision being made in Britain, and he uses this as evidence of him being an enlightened monarch. I know this is a little bit uh, more of a, of a world history question than a slavery question, but do you feel this is entirely accurate? I mean, that is a part to play. The king still has power, I think, in um, the affairs of British government during this period, uh, as most historians will know. But ultimately, um, is very dependent on parliament, which is thus, in this period, growing increasingly dependent on an increased electorate um, and mass action and mass politics that um, sort of come to characterize elections in Britain later on in the 19th and 20th century. Okay. Sure. So maybe William Wilber- Wilber- William Wilberforce maybe more so than uh, yeah. George III. Okay. And, and Thomas Clarkson especially. Okay. Um, that's at least my interpretation. But sure. uh, this of actually, course. Uh, there's, there's something to it, you know, that mm-hmm. King George III as an enlight- one of these enlightened monarchs really um, – uh, produce the conditions that allowed for this to succeed. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, but ultimately, I think, though, what can be shown from this long struggle over the transatlantic slave trade is not, you know, this natural sort of arc of progress from slavery to freedom with no, you know, struggle whatsoever, but rather the opposite. It's a continued struggle at every step of the way. Pro, as I mentioned, pro-slavery and anti-slavery, men and women, were equally, if not on the side of pro-slavery, more so adamant about their own goals. In some cases, in many cases actually, especially in the South, pro-slavery forces overwhelmed those of abolitionists, such as in Virginia, where I mentioned these anti-slavery societies um, that had flourished in the 1780s and 90s were forcibly and by, by that, I mean they were quite literally forcibly broken up and smashed by the state, by other slaveholding whites, and so on. However, for enslaved and freed African Americans, the suppression of the transatlantic trade was still an important victory, one step on the long and winding road toward ultimate emancipation. This emancipation, or jubilee, would also come by force through the fires of the Civil War and Reconstruction. Wow, this is uh, this is absolutely fan stuff, fantastic stuff, Griffin. Uh, so this has been a treat. Uh, I would like to put sort of some put forth some questions from the student, if you don't mind. But first, I think maybe we can take a quick break. Yeah. All right. So we're back again with Griffin. Um, they are going to be answering some questions. We've got some topics ranging from the Atlantic slave trade to what is it like being a historian. So thank you again for your time uh, and ready to get it started. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Our first question comes from Addy. Um, she asked, were there any people who fought against slavery? If so, how were they punished? Because she's assuming they're going to get punished. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, the answer is very much yes. Um, and this is true throughout slavery's history in any given society. There are, uh, um, in most uh, slavery societies, uh, there are, of course, the enslaved people, first and foremost, who resist and fight against slavery in every system um, of slavery, uh, no matter if you're looking at ancient Rome or if you're looking at the Western world or indigenous slavery in the Americas. Uh, there are aspects of resistance and rebellion all throughout um, history. But if we're talking about the Western context, um, I think uh, you start to see an organized movement outside of the enslaved people themselves um, is starting in about what Manisha Sinha, who's a historian at Connecticut, um, kind of points to about the mid, early to mid 1700s is when this starts to formulate. Um, and you're right to sort of hint that there, there are reprisals for this because slavery is still seen broadly as a given in the society, except among the enslaved themselves, of course, who negotiate at every turn. But um, there are 
a lot of people with vested interest in slavery. Um, and they often, more often than not, if not always, hold the reins of power in, in, the, uh, in government. And they um, use that power to its fullest extent. And they oftentimes uh, sow misinformation. Um, they, if not forcibly, go to the actual sort of meeting houses that these anti-slavery societies would meet in, and they would ransack it, and they would tar and feather, do all these you know, horrible things. Um, and then uh, things get even worse uh, as anti-slavery picks up. Um, as more and more people join the movement, uh, the reprisals become more violent. Uh, for instance, um, the enslaved who are re leading rebellions um, are often hanged, their heads put on pikes. Um, and uh, of course, the most notorious example is John Brown, who was a white man who led enslaved people uh, in 1859 to capture a federal armory at Harper's Ferry in Virginia to lead a broader anti-slavery abolitionist revolt. Uh, he failed, um, and he was executed by the state. All right. So that's, uh, yeah. that's, a, that's a topic we can look more into. Uh, we will be, don't worry, Addy, we will be looking at John Brown specifically uh, when we start to get around the idea of, of slavery in the United States as well, uh, as well as a couple other figures too. So uh, very good question there. Uh, moving on to the next one. The next one comes from Marty M. Uh, how did people back then view slavery? Um, I think that uh, first and foremost among enslaved people themselves, they knew slavery was unnatural. It was forced. They saw it every day. And they were forced to be slaves. They were, of course, anti-slavery from the very beginning, um, for the most part. And um, this can be seen in their daily acts of resistance, like um, breaking tools, slowing down, trying to escape uh, to maroon communities, or in the case of the United States, to the North and Canada. Um, so really, uh, there is this anti-slavery view from the very beginning of slavery, in at least in the Western world. We have far little evidence about ancient Rome, except the major slave rebellions. Mm -hmm. um, but even that, we can sort of uh, glean information from that. But for the Western world, um, these uh, for most white people, because slavery uh, differs in the Western world because it is racialized, because it is placed on Africans and African-descended people, not, as well as indigenous and ind indigenous-descended people, uh, to be slaves on these plantations and farms um, and cities as well. And um, so really you get a whole by, – by the time the Civil War begins, you get a whole variety of opinions about, the, about slavery that develop over the previous century. You get the very pro-slavery people who see it as not just a necessary evil but as a positive good like John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. And um, these people – argue that slavery is meant to civilize an inferior people um, and other such arguments that abolitionists in white abolitionists in the north uh, said that is baloney um, these people are equal to us these people deserve the same rights as us they are not inferior this is so self-serving um, above everything else um, and even among whites in the North, there's a variety of opinion. I don't want to make it seem like <laughs> any or even most white people in the North were abolitionists because abolitionists uh, were a very small minority of people, even as they boomed in the 1840s onward. Um, Anti-slavery people, uh, there's a difference. Abolitionists are more radical, uh, arguing oftentimes for immediate abolition. Anti-slavery people um, and the abolitionists also argue for the inherent equality of African and African descended people. Uh, Anti-slavery people view slavery as an evil um, to whites, not to enslaved Africans, which is bizarre, right? Because it is um, who can be more oppressed by slavery than the enslaved themselves. Right. But to these people, they uh, and the enslaved were part and parcel of this, that they inherently degraded white labor, and that therefore they should be removed as well as slavery, because they equated 
slavery with being an African or African-American. Okay, so I, you're touching on a topic that I think some of our current eighth graders should vaguely remember. Uh, and I, it could be John C. Calhoun that mentioned this, but there's the mudsill theory that there's someone that's on the yeah. bottom that, that we have to build from uh, build on top of. Uh, could you add a little bit about that, maybe that they might uh, that they might recall? Yeah, so mudsill theory actually comes from oh, what's his name, George Fitzhugh. He was a social theorist in the South. Is very prominent. If you look at any pro-slavery document source book, uh, it's George Fitzhugh. <laughs> you know, he's mm-hmm. talking all he's talking in periodicals and newspapers all throughout the antebellum period, and he's really um, he's really talking about the necessity of there being an enslaved population in any given society. That there needs to be this people, um, and that to determine who is going to be th- these people, we need to examine it through the lens of race and um, racial theory. And to him, that meant Africans mm-hmm. and African descended people, African Americans. That it meant that if you were black, you your natural condition was to be enslaved. Okay, so the, the way I believe we uh, we kind of talked about it uh, last year was that there's always going to be this bottom rung of society that their 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 existence is going to be kind of painful, uh, and that it's for yeah. the common good, quote unquote, of the rest yeah. of the nation. Yeah, and and a lot of scholars have picked up on this and have noted that um, slavery um, ultimately. While it did, uh, it gave white people a sense of uh, superiority because whoever you were, even if you were the poorest white, you could still say, "I'm not a slave." Mm-hmm. Um, and that that was important psychologically to white people. It's called wages of whiteness, and um, there's debate about it. But ultimate, because materially, there was no. You were a poor white, and you were still living in squalor. You know mm-hmm. how not different from any enslaved person. In fact, um, yeah, not different um, materially, but psychologically, you had the sense that you were not uh, a slave, and that was good enough for a lot of white people. Okay. At the risk of going even deeper into this question, this was a really good question for Marty. Yeah, it is. Um, it is a great question. One thing that we do when we start, but when we start to set up this, the, the the study of the Civil War, we we compare. The, the working hours of a typical factory worker in the north versus a plantation worker in the south. And obviously there's more negatives uh, inherently to a plantation worker in the south. But oh, we, yeah. we looked at the, 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 the poor hours, of course, in the north. You were getting paid very little and there wasn't much that you could really actually buy. And you, you were mostly working to live, which contrasted with a plantation worker you're you're living to work sort of deal um, um we, we we sort of drew some parallels between uh no one's really being successful unless you've kind of got a leg up already in this society exactly exactly all right i so, think that that's really important yeah all right so let's uh, let's go ahead and move on to our next question this comes yeah. from from tj uh were there any slave owners who treated their slaves well I think this is an interesting question um, because it comes up so often in both uh, older historians um, and as well as in public imagination of what slavery was. Um, My answer to that question as a historian of slavery is that fundamentally, no, there were no slave owners who treated their slaves well. At a fundamental level, they may, um, and I say this because I think the bar for what mean what it means to treat a slave well is so low, right? <laughs> like, like uh, people say, well, this enslaver, he didn't whip his slaves. Yeah. Really? <laughs> Would you say that about anybody else that they're a nice person because they don't do this act of violence to you? So I don't think we can say that people were, you know, slaves were often given good food or good medicine. And that often meant that um, uh, that was in a slaveholder's self-interest. Mm-hmm. To, There's ulterior yeah. motives there. Yeah, there, it is not out of the goodness of his or her heart. It is out of uh, self-interest in maintaining you as property. And I think to be to, to do this, I say fundamentally because on a fundamental level, 
to be a slave owner, you need to believe in one thing, that a group of people can be inferior and treated as property. That does not make you a good person, and it does not lead to anybody being treated well. And I think that this is important to get across to people, that at a fundamental level, slavery is violent. Slavery is inherently dehumanizing to to everybody it does it touches Mm -hmm. it is it is a system based and i i really don't want to sugarcoat it it is based in the most brute force and brute violence imaginable um in the most dehumanizing processes so i think that um a lot of people have sort of spilled ink and blood on this question about you know about well were there good slave owners and I just don't think that they're on, on a fundamental level. Yeah, I think that's a really strong answer. And I think that that makes sense because you're already having – in order to answer that question in a positive light, you have to look past the whole institution of slavery. Well, right. Well, well ignoring the fact that they were slaves, blah, yeah. blah, 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 right? So right. Uh, I think I think you're – I think that's a really insightful answer there. Uh, good yeah. question, TJ. Yeah, it's still a great question, and you're touching on really solid debates that have been happening since slavery was still happening. All right, good stuff. So let's transition now to just what is it like being an historian, stuff like that. A little bit, yeah. uh, a little bit more fun topic. Um, yeah. So this this question comes from Maggie, uh, and she asked, "What's it like to be an historian?" Um. So uh, I think it is. Uh, on a lot of different, in a lot of different ways, it's very. I think it's very fun. I think it's a. I picked this profession because I believed it was something that I truly enjoy doing, mm-hmm. and um, I think it's panned out that way in every sort of way um, since studying this as we went to UIC. Mm-hmm. That. Um, I think that um, studying it there, studying at Princeton, going to these conferences and talking about history with people, you talk about history a lot with with people, um, and therefore you get to meet a lot of new people. You get to travel to a lot of different places. Uh, of course, that's limited by what kind of research you're doing or what conferences you're going at or to. Or whatever illnesses are going around, but. Yeah, yeah, but not even mentioning that, but um I think that it's it gives you an opportunity to really network and talk with people on a personal level about this kind of – about history in general, really. I've talked with medievalists. I've talked with late antiquity Roman people. I've talked with sort of these, these European historians and so on and so forth, and it really gives you that kind of opportunity to meet people. But – um, when you're not meeting people, you're oftentimes in the library, um, you're in the archive, you're at, <laughs> for me, I like to uh, work at, um, at, on a, on my chair or sofa, um, just writing and, and reading really. That's, that's what it's all about. And I think there's a certain, um, especially when you're in archives, there's a very, uh, there's a magic to it. You know, history really comes alive when you're in an archive or dealing with any kind of primary source. And that's, that's what it's sort of like, um, you live for those moments of like, you know, you're in the archive, you're, you're dealing with history, you know, firsthand, um, like touching the actual document, reading it, so on, uh, or artifact. And, uh, that's really, um, special and it makes, you know, all those hours you're sitting in the library or on your sofa writing and reading makes it all worthwhile. And I, and those things are still fun to me, mind you, <laughs> but, um, but it, it's still, um, you know, you do a lot of things as a historian, I think. Okay. That's cool. Uh, so following up on that for Mary Therese, we've got a question. What does a regular day look like as a historian? Well, uh, I started off like anybody else. Um, you know, I woke up this morning at around seven. Just I do my daily routine, um, like any kind of career person would do. Put your pants on one leg at a time, so on and so forth. Uh, and you, um, a lot of my days spent. Um, well, when I was at Princeton, I'm I'm back at home in Chicago now. Um, when I was at Princeton, my daily routine would look like, I don't know, uh, 
I would have a class seminar at 9 a.m. And those are fun because you talk with your peers and with your colleagues and with your professors just about history for, for two, two and a half hours, um, just, you know, with a break, but like uh, just talking history and historiography and the history of history and how history is written, and the narratives that come into play, and what you think about history for 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 a good period of time, and it's really um, can be uh, exhausting on one level, but it's also extremely satisfying. And then after seminar, I'll eat lunch, interface, and talk with with people, um, my friends, my peers, my colleagues at lunch and then I'll go to the library. And uh, that is the that is the place where I spend most of my time. Um, taking breaks frequently is important, uh, but also reading uh, a lot. <laughs> reading and writing a lot. That, yeah. is, that is sort of what my day is. Yeah, but I treat it like a nine to five job. Um, I really come in at nine, I make sure that I get my allotted readings done by five and uh, head out. And go home and do whatever I like to do, which, as you know, is uh, watch sports. Yeah, <laughs> it was fun to watch sports until they uh, yeah. vanished off the face of the earth. But uh, right. with you yeah. there. all right, awesome. So uh, this next question comes from Mara. What qualities do you need to be an historian? And I'm going to guess here you got to like reading and you got to like writing. Yeah, so those are two of the things you got to at least tolerate it. Um, <laughs> I think there, it, it can be fun to do, but that's just me talking. I've been mm-hmm. doing this for a long time, um, maybe too long. But <laughs> um, well, uh, so to be a historian, I thought about this a lot, um, and I think to be a historian means you need to not only read a lot, but you need to read with an eye to to um, uh, narrative. For one, if you're doing well in your English classes, you're gonna you're gonna have a good time in history. I think there's a sort of correlation there. Mm-hmm. Um, you need to learn source analysis. I think is most important, and also the most basic skill um, that I think takes a lot of practice, um, which uh, in this digital age is really helpful because there's so many online resources, as you know to look up a primary source and and read through it and analyze it. The who, the what, the when, the where, the why, and the how of of these sources. And uh, you really get to do that in archives and in libraries and in museums. Um, You get to hone those skills really well. Um, But it takes uh, daily practice, I think. And it helps to be in school where this is sort of a set schedule. Um, and I think that that's probably among the most important skill you need, uh, at a most basic technical level is to learn how to read a source. And if you have the time, if you're interested in pursuing this, um, whether it be as a historian, a professor, an archivist, a librarian, whatever, I think it's really important to start, um, sort of interacting with primary sources early. And I say this, um, Partially as sort of to the students who are really interested in this, um, when the libraries and archives open back up again, whenever that is, um, go to them. I, I, re- I reckon, or museums too. Um, it, it really, uh, our, most archives and libraries are open to the public for free. Um, in Chicago, there's the Newberry Library. There's the Chicago Historical Society the Chicago History Museum, um, all of these places. The Hull House Museum, as you know, mm-hmm. I yes. actually interned there, and I um, sort of am familiar with their collections. And you can go in and get a tour of their collections and all that kind of stuff. And I think it's really important to get to interact with these materials. Um, if you have the time, you know, get your parents. I'm sure it'll be a fun field trip um, <laughs> to go yeah, to an archive. Absolutely. And you can contact them in advance to, to ask what you want. Um, look at their website, look at their uh, collections or holdings, and um, really just explore and be curious. Um, that's I think that's probably the most important. And you're all tech savvy, I'm sure, so okay. you know how to navigate those websites better than I do. All right, fantastic. Uh, so if I could uh, just interject just a comment and just let me know if I'm wrong here. But um, – I think it's important that, that, that 
I, there was a couple questions. We're not going to get to these questions, huh? uh, unfortunately, that we're asking, do you study all of history or is it just one topic? And it's kind of, you got to find your favorite or your niche or yeah. what, 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 your passion within history. And that way, when you're reading all these archives, you're reading all these primary sources, it's something that you're interested in. You're not, it's not a, it's not a chore. It's, it's a passion, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, so yeah, once, once you find that niche, that niche, that, that little area that really interests you, that question that really itches at your mind, um, it's really fun to then explore and do the kind of Indiana Jones work. Right. (laughs) Um, And that I'm, I'm as a, um, as a, uh, uh, just to let you know, that's not most of what we do. (laughs) Unfortunately, I wish, I wish I could go to archives all the time, but I can, I unfortunately can't, but when I do, it's very much an Indiana Jones kind of thing. Awesome, awesome. So, uh, this question coming that we got two questions in a row coming actually from Liam. So, some good questions from you, Liam. If you were not a historian, what profession would you choose? Um, yeah, I, I think this is good because it gives um, your students who may be interested in pursuing history down the line sort of an out in case you know you can't really uh, go into academia for whatever reason or do this. Um, professor kind of to kind of business or grad school for financial reasons, for logistical reasons, stuff like that, or just as a topic of interest, there are other ways that you can pursue history. And for me, um, it turned out um, my backup plan was if this uh, going to grad school, trying to get into academics, um, ac- the academy, if that didn't work for me, it was going to end up being a, um, an archi- I wanted to be an archivist uh, or a librarian because they require the same skills. And my backup to that backup plan was to go <laughs> to law school um, because uh, law requires a lot of research skills and a lot of writing skills that y- you really hone as a historian. Cool. So, so uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of options available. Yeah, is what I'm trying to say. You don't have to be a history professor to do history. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, going back to the qualities, a lot of jobs require you to be able to read and write. It's, it's not yeah. it's not a, a, a talent that's going to go to waste, per se. Absolutely. All right. Let's go on to Liam's second question here. Uh, and this is this, this one at the risk of running a long time here. How much do you think history helps us today? Oh, um, I really uh, I think about this often because. I try and make my history public facing. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think a lot of historians do too. And um, I think what, it sounds so cliche to make, to make this answer, but I think what history really does is sort of show you where we've been and how the present came to be. I think that's really for, for issues of like, you know, studying slavery, for example, and race, you know, you see where these problems come into play today um, with with everything happening politically and socially. You sort of get the understanding that these things were constructed at one point. They can be deconstructed. They can be um, uh, they can be reformed. They can be changed. And that's really powerful knowledge to know. And on a more logistical, technical basis, you can by doing a deep delve into it you can sort of see how it was constructed and how to maybe change things that are unjust or unfair. So history really kind of provides perspective. What, what, how did we get here? We didn't just, you weren't born and you were just teleported onto the planet. It was, there was things before you that happened and there's going to be things that happen after you. uh, And basically kind of like, what's your influence in this whole long narrative? Yeah, exactly. I think that that, um, even if your students aren't going to pursue history, I encourage you to do (laughs) just as a matter of course. But, um, if I encourage everyone to really keep that sense of history at the very least in mind, um, even, even if you don't pursue it, um, keep it in mind for your, for your own life and what you choose to do. 
because I can tell you everything has a history. Yeah. <laughs> this is a question historians go over is like, where do we draw the line about what is history and what is not? I, I have a very broad definition of what history is. Sure. I think everything has a history to it. Everything sort of time just moves on and, and um, time marches on. So I think that everything, you know, if you're going into engineering, for example, I think that um, there's a history to engineering. That's really fascinating that I have kind of dabbled in doing this ironworks business. Um that I think is really important and really interesting to see where you've come from. Sure. Sure. All right. Uh, so we, we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up here with a couple more, and then we'll uh, yeah. we'll we'll release you from this uh, this wonderful interview. Um, coming from Matt M. There's two questions from Matt M. We'll we'll do both of them, uh, or actually we'll split them up because this his second one's a really good one to end on. Uh, the first one. What's the most important part, or excuse me, what's the most interesting part of history in your opinion? Now that's not, an, I'm sure that's an easy one to answer. <laughs> uh, for me, it's the period I study, uh, right. as I think most people. Yeah, I, I have my various interests outside of U.S. history, but I think that the most interesting thing to me is the period between 1815 and 1877 in the United States. There's just so much happening. There's so much happening. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've only begun to realize how much is happening at any given time. That's the good thing about history is that there's always so much happening constantly. Mm -hmm. You have no shortage of materials to go off of. Um, I just think that the various questions that Americans thought about during this period, um, whether it be about in industry or whether it be about slavery, the combination of the two um, – and agriculture and gender and the family, all these questions that we take for or that we are questioning now, they were also questioning in really interesting ways. All right. So we've got a second question coming from Mara. I know it's coming. Your, <laughs> who is your uh, favorite historical figure and why? Uh, um, so I have um, – in terms of American history – I think my favorite figure that intrigues me the most is perhaps um, uh, I think that the early Republicans are really interesting. Um, the early sort of radical Republicans. I think Thaddeus Stevens is my favorite figure in history, in American history. Um, he was a senator from – Oh, Pennsylvania, I think. Um, and he served throughout the Civil War from before the Civil War through Reconstruction. And he was the most radical kind of like pro civil rights, pro equal rights, just a fierce advocate, uh, advocate of, of, of uh, free people's rights and the abolition of slavery throughout his time. He, he was a very principled guy. And he was very um, – no, he's, he's a really interesting figure. He's my personal – one of my heroes, I think. All right. All right. We're going we're gonna to look into Thaddeus Stevens when we get to, to, that, to that topic. Yes. So we'll make sure to do our due diligence there and, and make you proud. Um, All right. Yeah. And our final question here. And this one I thought, uh, Matt, well done with uh, making it relevant to what we're talking about here. Uh, and I know this sparked a lot of debate with your, with your pals over in, in, uh, in Princeton – who was the most important monarch during the Middle Ages? <laughs> I love this question. I love it. I, I really don't know. Um, I'm, I'm not a medievalist, unfortunately. Medieval, is, medieval history is really interesting. There's a lot of great work being done about the sort of interactions of the Middle Ages in Europe. Like the connections between Europe and Africa and Asia are just really complex and fascinating because I think it goes to the point that, you know, Europe was not isolated during the Middle Ages. It was mm -hmm. in constant contact with Asians and Africans all across the world. Um, and I think that um, this did spark a lot of debate in my um, my first year cohort group chat. Um, I, I, I was asking uh, my medievalist colleagues to sort of sound off and sort of give what they thought. And they came up with two interesting answers. The first is Eleanor of Aquitaine, um, my friend and colleague, Courtney, uh, uh, who does French uh, medieval history, uh, medieval women's history. And she talked about um, uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine, who, I, to my knowledge, was 
both the Queen of England and France at a given time. Impressive. Probably the most powerful woman in Europe during this period. Mm -hmm. And she was just, um, yeah, a really powerful uh, monarch. Um, during this period <laughs> and then my friend who who does early modern history which is a different time period from medieval uh joseph and he uh he came up with alfonso the 10th of, of of spain and um alfonso the 10th was a very famous poet as well as king uh very um he published a lot of his own poetry and that, that's what I know. I don't know about the policies or anything or what wars they got into, but I, I know I know that. Um, <laughs> I did a little digging. There you go. But, yeah. All right. So two really interesting answers. So we got a couple people we could look into. Ellen, Eleanor of Aquitaine and Alfonso X. We'll have to dig deep on that one. Yes. Yes. Well, Griffin, I would once again. I want to thank you for your time. It's been it's been fantastic having this. You taking this chunk out of your day to talk to us. Uh, I'm I'm sure the students are really going to appreciate it. So, uh, thank you again from the bottom of my yeah. heart. <laughs> yeah, I just I just want to say this is really fantastic, um, and I'm really happy to have had the chance to talk with people about history and about uh, what I study and how and how it relates to what we're talking about in in our present moment and i encourage everyone to just be curious and and be um be curious about history and everything else yeah all right well uh well that's all we got today i hope you'll come back maybe uh in a later date maybe we can have a round two of this interview huh yeah i would love that yeah absolutely thank you for your questions everybody those very excellent questions and i hope i gave um uh, good answers to them I'm sure you did. Thank you again for joining us. Yeah, thank you. All right, bye. (laughs) Bye.